stretch up in the air. Give it a stretch. Down, down, down. Oh. All right, now I want you to walk around the table once. Do a little circle around your table. Come on, do it. I want some blood flowing. I want some, some good Q&A here. <laughs> All right, there you go, now. Doesn't that feel good? <sighs> okay. Where's the Yule log? This is a fireside chat, isn't it? Okay, so we'll see if we get the Yule log. All right, everybody. Um, I have beside me one of the preeminent researchers in broadcast television. Um, I believe David has been at CBS now for 40 years? 44. 44 years. Let's give him a round of applause for that. <laughs> so, you know, before we get started, I guess the question is probably on everyone's mind. You hit room 2108 last night? Were you in 2108 last night? 2108? Yeah, the party room. Oh, I don't know what the, no, I did not hit 2108. Are you sure? Because I heard rumors that you might have been there. Oh, okay, no. You know a guy named Miles? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ah. All right, before they throw me out of here. Mm -hmm. uh, David, um, you know what? I mean, 44 years, I don't even know what to say to that. Uh, you want to just tell us maybe what you think is the biggest change? <laughs> Now, ver no, I can't even say it now versus 44 years ago. How about the biggest change for you in this business today versus, say, a decade ago? Okay, well, another way to put that is that if you look at the, that uh, span of time and you move forward in uh, the changes that took place in the television business, so, uh, the significant changes, yeah. uh, we're in 1980. Cable came along. In 1987, people meters came along. In 2000, the DVR came along. 2000, really? Yep, 2000 was when the, the DVR came along. Uh, and all of that time, those are really the only significant changes, and television really didn't change that much. If you look at the last two years, you have the combination of streaming, VOD, mobile, social, and second screen interactivity. Uh, so what I say is that in the last two years, you've had more change in television, in the television environment than you had in the 40 before it. Yeah. You're, you're, you're telling me, Snapchat. Um, okay, so, so let's get right into it then. Let's get a little controversial, right? I think there's a lot of people in this room who uh, go to see a lot of marketers and a lot of folks in the digital industry. And uh, I think it's a pretty common belief that, um, you know, that they, they believe broadcast TV is a shrinking entity. Maybe it's an entity that's, uh, you know, eventually not going to be, have the strength or the power that it once had or maybe doesn't anymore. Um, you know, and we've seen advertiser budgets move certainly from broadcast to other areas. But what, what, you know, what would you say to people like that that would surprise them, or um, you know, maybe be a, a testament to, you know, the product that CBS offers? Well, I, I mean, I think they, they've missed uh, a, a lot. Okay, that essentially broadcast television, and look, it's a, it's a much more competitive environment. There are a lot of new competitors uh, that we have to compete against. But if you look at broadcast television and you look at what has changed what today versus those pre previous eras, uh, so pre-DVR, it was a linear-only measurement, uh, a li linear-only business. Now it is no longer linear. If you give when a broadcast network in a linear world programmed 54% of the day, and during that 54% of the day, uh, uh, 
uh, 81%, only 80% of the people were in their home. So essentially what it came down to, the math ends up that the, during a 24 hour day, the person had access to broadcast programming only 33% of the time. So only 33% of the time were there any ability to access broadcast content. Today, you can access broadcast content 100% of the time, everywhere you are. If, if you have a, a product that was only available 33% of the time, now it's available 100% of the time, that is a significant opportunity and a significant enhancement. Second, the internet has dramatically improved and it added to the, the uh, advertising effectiveness of television. Because t the way advertising works, and particularly television, it builds awareness and it builds interest. If it effectively builds a awareness and interest, then you have to do something about it. You have to go out and buy the product. You have to research the product. Pre the internet, the way you did that is you went to a showroom, or you followed up maybe that weekend. Now, in the internet stage, you have search. You can immediately respond to that advertising, and that has, and we have research to show it, significantly improved the effectiveness of television advertising. And then finally, on top of that, you now have interactivity. You've got two-thirds of the people who are watching those ads simultaneously connected to the internet through some device so they can react almost immediately. And that, again, has enhanced the medium. So as an advertising medium, I think broadcast net television is superior to where it has been historically. Okay, so, uh, so digital, mobile have amplified the, the effect. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, I think we all see that, and that, uh, that speaks to, I think, a lot of what this conference is about, right? It's basically about, we're not talking about replacing TV, we're talking about empowering. Um, okay, uh, so that, that, all, that all said, um, we, ha we are starting to see usage levels fall off in television overall. Um, and you know, I presented some of those slides uh, on Monday. You, you, you've seen them before, you weren't here yesterday. But uh, you know, we had, we had seen some pretty consistent growth in television usage for the last decade. And I think we were sort of attributing that to the advent of HD and DVRs, you know, getting people more involved in, in TV. Um, their cable, oper the cable systems were giving them more choice. It was just in general a more robust experience for them. Um, but for the last two or three years, we've started to see a pretty consistent fall off in TV usage at this point. What do you think is driving that? Well, first I disagree with it. So, oh, okay. Uh, the, because I don't think it includes, it, it depends on whether or not you include the streaming of television programs as part of television. Actually, the viewership of network television product, uh, I mean, the, viewer, the, the viewership level for television, of television programming, uh, this year is up 2% versus last year. The live portion of that has gone down from 89% to 81%. Mm -hmm. uh, streaming and, uh, and VOD are the growth right. platforms. So the on-demand is, so is offsetting. The actual amount of television viewing and uh, viewing of television programs by the, gen by the general population actually is up this year and has been going up. In terms of primetime network television programs, yes. the top 30 primetime network television programs, if you count the total audience that views those programs, now that's not what the advertiser gets because this is in coming in different platforms, but the total audience that views those programs is essentially the same as it was in the year 2000 and for the top 30, and the top and the audience that it looks at that it, uh, is exposed to the top 30 television programs in the last five years has been up in three of those five years, counting all of the platforms. All the platforms. So, I did talk about this yesterday, which was the idea that live is coming down and on demand is really supplanting that. So it's really just moving audiences from maybe one glass to the other, like pouring a glass of water. But I had thought that um, I hadn't, you know, I had presented that the usage had gone down. You're basically saying if you add in the on-demand usage, usage is up. Yes, you, you 
to up two percent. Up two percent, according okay. to uh, Nielsen statistics. And the top thirty programs are delivering the same amount of audiences as they were ten, uh, thirteen years ago, fourteen years ago. Yeah. Wow. Uh, uh, they were. The, it's essentially the same audience. Now, in that case, <clears throat> we have to. We only have data for on the stream. We only have good data on the streaming and VOD for CBS program, and so we use the same lifts projected to the other network. Okay, so it's a proxy, but but not. it's but it's pretty accurate, I think, and and generally, uh, you know, I think it it, it makes sense. That yeah. Um, for CBS specifically, do you see, um, is it like, is, can, is, can CBS be a growing business and continue to be a growing business for the next 10 years? Yes, because all these new platforms are going to, are, are going to grow. They're going to continue to grow. Uh, VOD is, is going to grow significantly. Uh, the, uh, there is the concept. The opportunity presented by ODCR, okay, which is on-demand commercial uh, ratings, a and the the concept here is is a simple one, that, and it's it's a, ch a game changer, and it's just beginning. This is the first year that the networks have been stream have been using uh, VOD right after air, mm -hmm. and and capturing it within the three-day window. The the concept of ODCR takes that one step further with dynamic ad insertion. And what it does is it says, if you buy a spot in CSI uh, this week, your ads run in, in not only that episode of CSI live and that episode of CSI on VOD, but they are digitally inserted into every episode of CSI that is watched during that, that week uh, on VOD, all the back episodes are digitally inserted. The library for the same that season, is, or, or yeah, we are. Uh, we have, that is, has been tested and is ready with Comcast. Comcast, CBS, NBC have tested it, and we're ready. It's ready to be run. The digital insertion is taken care of. Uh, the technology is there. Nielsen has captured it and can measure it. And that can be done. That can be. That is going to significantly increase uh, the potential audience that we can deliver to an advertiser, and an audience that we can deliver to an advertiser on a day-specific point time, mm -hmm. point in time. Because of digital ad insertion, for a movie company, we can say you want your ads to run on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We can digitally insert them just on those days. So you said that that's, um, does everybody get that? that he's, David's saying that um, the TV networks we know now are, are leaving the commercial reel in the show for the first three days on their VOD platform. So basically what airs on CBS on Monday night airs in those shows on VOD for three days. He's now suggesting that they're going to put that same commercial reel in um, all of the past episodes for the same three days on the VOD platform. So anybody that goes to any of those shows will see the same commercial reel um, for the library content. Now, you said that's on Comcast that's been tested. Is that, does that need to be universally rolled out to all the cable providers before you can sell that to us nationally? Well, now, Comcast, if Comcast also means Time Warner Cable, you're a long way to getting uh, full coverage. Uh, the other, uh, the, the agreements are in place allowing for it across all of the, the um, the MVPDs. Mm -hmm. uh, How far away was the technology that? right now? Comcast is the only one that has the technology, and we're, we hope the others will for follow. The for the dynamic ad insertion. For the dynamic ad insertion, yes. Okay. That we're talking about. How far away are you? Do you think be, before we're dynamically ad inserting across all MVPDs, essentially across the nation, for VOD? I think this will be such a compelling proposition that the other ones will come on board pretty quickly. Yeah. Year. So, I, two years. Within two years? Yeah. Okay. Do you plan on selling upfront agreements with that included in on the Comcast side, or is that not feasible because it's not national and Nielsen wouldn't rate it? Well, 
No, Nielsen will rate it. It doesn't have to be national for Nielsen to rate it. Okay, so I, they can add it into the number. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they can they can build it into the number. But you're still not going to necessarily throw it in there until. Well, we're going obviously this is, it's all part of a, neg a negotiation. We're, we'll look for leading edge advertisers who are willing to experiment with us, but we you know we want to make sure that it, it's what our advertisers want before we move. Yeah, forward, and well, that's why we're doing the series of tests. Right. Um, DVRs versus VOD. Um, what do you think about that? You think that um, with the ease of VOD and the more the greater availability of it, um, of programming there, do you think that that supplants DVRs eventually? That's my goal. I mean, the in two thousand two, when DVRs were first emerging, I was a great proponent of and arguing with the MVPDs at that time that they were going in the wrong direction. You don't want to develop DVRs because DVRs take the control of the programming right. out of your hands and give them to the consumer. You can deliver the same consumer benefit by going to VOD. Mm -hmm. And they, at that time, went with the DVR alternative for competitive reasons because the satellite guys were initially initiating it and they had a response. Uh, and then they got so much capital invested in DVRs and they were getting the monthly uh, rent, so they stayed with it. Comcast has always been sort of the outcast in that. They, they're the one cable uh, operator that did not emphasize they didn't push. DVR. They emphasized VOD from the beginning. They charge a higher p price for their uh, DVRs, so they have a lower circulation of, of DVRs. They're only about 30s, in the high 30s instead of the uh, mid 40s, mm -hmm. and they push VOD. Uh, we, you know, the industry would be tremendously well served by the fact that if we could eliminate the D DVR mm -hmm. and move to the VOD platform. We've done a lot of work with consumers and uh, in the last three months to suggest that they are interested in moving in that direction, particularly they like the idea of saving the money of not having to have that DVR bill. So I think it, once we get enough episodes for all the shows on the platform, I think there will be a migration. Not a total migration. DVR is always going to be with us. People want to fast forward to commercials, but I think there will be some migration away. And, and VOD will continue to grow. So uh, I'm curious, do you see a different, like I, this speaks to it, I guess, a little bit. Um, so the idea of the value of a viewer in VOD to you is much higher th for advertisers than a viewer in DVR playback. Right, because, because there's, there's a higher there's chance. Dis of, we disabled the fast forwarding yep. in, in, in video. Uh, what about VOD versus online video or tablet or mobile? Do you? Do you assess a similar value to those different platforms for the same program? Well, online, uh, you know, online streaming has all the value. Uh, you know, with digital ad insertion, VOD uh, has the, the concept of addressability. They have the concept of, uh, of targeting. Uh, but all these things are available online, too. And, and we, ha we already have, we're already employing them in our CBS Interactive program, and so we can provide the type of targeting and addressability within that, uh, within the uh, streaming or online world, uh, and the VOD allows us to extend that to another platform. But uh, the, the combination of, of the two, I think, is, is very powerful. So in your mind, the value comes from the addressability and targetability option? basically, as opposed to it being a higher value because it might be a bigger screen well, it's, or... It's a, well, it's a addressability, uh, target, target uh, interactivity, uh, but also a, just a way to increase the access to the product among the consumers and maintain the higher audience levels, the higher overall audience levels. Before we move on to a different subject, you know, Adam talked earlier today about the sort of the um, the metric, the measurement continuum, and, and where we are with respect to DVR measurement and VOD measurement, et cetera. And he mentioned that 
um, essentially VOD, age, sex, demographics, not really measurable yet. Um, well, they are within the Nielsen. But I the mean, C3 with the same commercial. With, with, within C3 now, we, we are measuring, uh, we're getting full information uh, about that because uh, Nielsen, is, as long as Nielsen's carrying in the currency and it's encoded and everything, we can measure it. And then, so Nielsen's defining the audiences. We know the VOD audience, from an advertiser's point of view, it's a dream audience. Mm -hmm. It's younger upscale, and it, it's the audience advertisers want. So it's a very, and we know that from the Nielsen data we already have. Uh, Nielsen does not continue to measure it outside of the advertising window. So how do we get there? Well, in the first place, the movement from C3 to C7 uh, is, see, the movement from C3 to C7 int int introduces something. This is his way of negotiating for his sales team, just so we're clear? Yeah, that's right, yes. Uh, what that means, if you move from C3 to C7, and you, we have the ODCR that I talked about, mm -hmm. then actually what you have is, you, you've now closed the loop. You, you ascend, the, an advertiser advertises in CSI, like I said. His ad, that advertiser's ad runs until the next original episode. And when the next original episode runs, then those advertisers run in all the episodes. Well, if you actually do that in a seven day window, you essentially have a, VOD, a fully su supported VOD product going forward. Right now, when, on the C3, we have, to, we have to pull all the ads out at the end of three days. So mm -hmm. right now, if you, if you, on the VOD platform, we take all the ads out. Why would it, now, an advertiser you love, assert advertisers love paying, not paying for that extra four, four to seven days, but they certainly don't, there's no reason that they would ever want their ads to come out because it's an, up, as I say, younger upscale audience. They'd like to have their ads stay there. Yeah, I think but, that what they want is they want to be able to change them. You know, they don't want to run and, for seven days. Yeah, and, and the ability to change them uh, is, that's without dynamic ad insertion. Mm -hmm. Nielsen, the, real, the reason Nielsen measures only the three days and the, and the reason they say you have to run the same ads is because they want to ensure that, from a, uh, that they're giving the advertiser what the advertiser paid for. And if, the ad, if, they, start, if, they, if they start measuring ads that are sold separately in the total audience and that, we're, so that the original advertiser did not get, uh, that's not fair to the advertiser. So they say, well, you've got to run the same ads in both platforms. But if the advertiser bought the spot mm -hmm. and they are getting what they paid for because they, it's, they, they control that spot and they voluntarily opt to take out their commercial and put in another commercial, then Nielsen will have no problem with that. They shouldn't, but do they? Well, no one's done it yet. So no one has I've come always been to under Nielsen. the impression that they like literally can't measure it unless it's the same commercial load because it have it's encoded or something. Like it's a that's what I'm worried about. It it, it can be done because they can measure it. It has to be a cooperative effort with the uh, MVPD because they 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 have to when but when they do the digital insertion, it is possible through encoding in the digital insertion to. To, to conform that. to the Nielsen measurement. So it's doable, it's complex, so Nielsen isn't going to do it until somebody demands it, but we can do that. Hey, Nielsen guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's go with that. Let's mm -hmm. go forward. I'm, I'm, I spent some money. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Um, when do you think that'll happen? When do you think that, is that also two years? No, I think that can happen. In, that can happen as soon as we start going to ad, uh, digital ad insertion. That, yeah. That's because that to me, that to me is more acceptable than C7 because now I can tell my client that there's a big chunk of that advertising that they can traffic on a day-to-day -day basis if they want to. Maybe many of them won't, but the ones that really would like to, I think that they would find that conversation more compelling. Um, okay, so let's see. We've gotten a little off track. Uh, so, all right, let's talk about, I know you've put a lot of, like we've probably touched on a little bit here, but 
Uh, you're going to be making some announcements next week, right? Um, to the advertising community? Yes, we're going to present a, a major, a couple of major research uh, pieces of research next week. Yeah. So, is there anything that you think you could share without, like, you know, blowing the whole story? But, like, because mm. these guys are here, you're here, I'm here, let's be happy. Let's share some, maybe well, some top line insights. Well, I'll give you an ad for, the, for, for what's coming next week. So, the, the, uh, in 2010, uh, we commissioned from Nielsen and uh, there are a, a part of Nielsen called Cambridge Group uh, a major segmentation of the video marketplace, the consumer market for video, and not for video, for all media, the media marketplace. And we presented that uh, in, 2000, in, in the beginning of 2011. And it was integrated into all the Nielsen databases. So you can go to Nielsen NPower and you can look at that segmentation. Uh, you can go to MRI and you can look at that segmentation. Uh, we made it on an open source basis, allowing the entire anyone to get access to it. What are the segments? Uh, the, the key segments are a, a segment called Media Trendsetter, uh, which are the, is the segment that really is driving the media industry, it drives innovation in the electronics industry, it's driving a, a innovation in the online industry. It's an, uh, it, people are from all age groups, they tend to be urban, a high representation, multicultural, and they also are the social diffusers. They are the people who talk about media, and they are social diffusers in other categories as well. They're very important. Program Passionates is another one. These are people, um, this is the highest, most upscale segment. They do not watch as much television as the general population, the but the shows they, they show they watch, the shows they watch, they love, and they're very passionate about. And the third area is, the third interesting area is streamers, which were, in 2010 when we did it, were a smaller segment, young. So now, we've, what we've done is we have redone that segmentation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this, you did the, you essentially looked at the media habits or the TV viewing habits of those segments. No, we looked at media habits, social habits, uh, okay. the entire gamut. Uh, okay. uh, 145 questions, uh, 45 minute survey, very thorough. We've now redone that segmentation with Nielsen again, and now in the, in redoing it, we've added more about social. We've added a whole uh, area on SVOD measurement. Uh, we've added a lot of area Subscription VOD for you <laughs> new, newbies. Uh, we've added a lot of information on uh, use of multiple devices, uh, all the new uh, uh, Netflix and things like that. Mm -hmm. That, we're going to present the results next week. What we'll, you will find is that there have been dramatic changes in how people watch television, but not, uh, not what they watch on television. So you know, what they're watching hasn't changed that much. How, how they're, they're watching, watching it has changed substantially. Uh, the other thing that we are going to be presenting is uh, the, uh, what was been talked about all day here, and that is a movement away from age and sex demographics to utilizing all the new uh, tools at our disposal to evaluate our audiences in ways that are more relevant to advertisers. Uh, we have purchased over 60 categories of product usage information from C Nielsen Catalina and Nielsen Buyer Index. Uh, we have we've made the big deal with Rentrack. Uh, we are compiling all the information to define our audiences in a way that are much more relevant to the advertising environment today and to advertisers and the big data capability and to provide the big data cap capabilities and we're going to be demonstrating that as well next week. So, okay, that's like an interesting little nugget right there. Um, you purchased all this data? Yeah. You purchased like one time only or it's available no, to you ongoing. regularly? No, okay. ongoing. Okay, so ongoing. Um, do you want to set up shop and start selling those demos instead of uh, adults 25 to 54? We, the, we, we want to sell the medium to its most greatest effectiveness with advertising. We want to demonstrate how 
why certain programs are differentiated from others and how they provide You mean like the military channel for people who buy lingerie? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, okay. And so we want to have those discussions. We want to have those conversations. The transactional nature of the business, as we have been discussing here today, in, is it's a much more difficult step. And so, so there's, there's a, there's, there's a, there are values to a currency uh -huh. that go beyond whether or not it's relevant, equally relevant to the different advertisers. It's, it's a currency. Okay, it's, so this is about helping clients find their customers and find them in high, in high numbers and high composition. Yes. But um, the transactional nature should maybe stay on, a, on, on something that's right. available to all partners. But what we're looking for is we're looking for a partnership with the advertiser and the program. It, we we want to go beyond the 30-second announcement. We want to be able to say this is a program that's watched by 17 million people. Uh, and those you have the ability to communicate with those 17 million people in an environment where two-thirds of them are simultaneously connected to the internet with some device. How do we maximize that experience for you as an advertiser? How do we give you the interactive capabilities? How do we provide the social, con social media that help stimulate that business? Let's not, let's think of this as a much more collaborative thing than you just buying a 30-second announcement. So what's a good example program. of that? What would you do? What would you offer an advertiser that allows them to do that? Well, so, so Under the Dome is one of the shows that we, we did this. Oh, I thought you were going to like say Under the Dome. No, no, like no. Your, oh. Under the Dome. So what, the, the, ideally the way this would work, so we're going to present research on Under the Dome next week, but we've got Under the Dome 2 coming. We have Extant, Extant coming now. Saying to the advertisers, well, let's work with. So if you're interested in some kind of sponsorship, some kind of relationship with the show, well, we, we start promoting these shows. We're already promoting Extant six months out. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should make your commitment now, and we'll tie in the promotion with you just like, you do with, just like they do with movies. Uh, and tie into the show and get on board right now. So build uh, with joint, you know, build branded promotions and things like right. that. Continue through. Uh, have a social campaign built around this program. Uh, and create an interactive experience that people can. That goes on throughout the broadcast. Uh, show. Throughout the show. You know, uh, to give you. Uh, to maximize the experience for you, because it's, it's the way to take advantage of what will be a very engaging experience when it comes on the air. I think that's great. Um, we are doing that with some of our TV partners. I think uh, I'm glad that CBS is considering all this stuff. I think that's, um, that's really forward thinking. Uh, speaking of forward thinking, um, what episode of uh, House of Cards are you on? Uh, I've, I've seen the, I've gone through the first step season and I haven't started the second season yet. All right. But I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a little bit of, of course, Reed Hastings and, and uh, folks at Netflix don't want to share their information, but we track all these shows and we track House of Cards. House of Cards is a very successful show. Uh, it, if you, the, so if you look at it, uh, about, 30, 33% of the population are Netflix subscribers. 30% of them watch the first episode of uh, House of Cards. And how do, you get, how do you know that? Because we track them in our own panel with our own research. Okay. okay. And, and I always say, whenever I say this, I always say to Netflix, uh, if you don't agree with my numbers, say so. Tell the world what the real number is. <laughs> okay. And they haven't told it yet, so they must like my numbers. All right, so let's see uh, what they say. So 33% of the population, 30% of them watch the show. So a third of a third. Got right. it. And they watched 11 of 13 episodes on average. That, av that translates to uh, an 8.6 rating nationally for this show. Uh, they, per episode? Yeah, per, uh, yeah, per episode. So you said, well, that's a pretty good rating, right? 
uh, and that would make that a, a quite a successful show. The only, there's only one caveat. It took them a year to accumulate it. Ah, okay. And if, so if you take the 8.6 rating that accumulated over the course of a year, mm -hmm. it's a 0.06 rating per day. You, like, you had me so built up there for a second. <laughs> I was excited and it so, crushed me. So it's a successful show. It's, it's a different economic situation. Yeah. It, it, wor it, it works beautifully for them, but it, it isn't for them dramatically the changing the way uh, the prime time environment. Yeah. It's, it's showtime, HBO type of success, but if they, could, if they could duplicate that 100 times or even 20 times, then it, it adds up to something, but it costs $100 million. So I don't think it would be very cost effective for them. But it's a, it, it is uh, a very successful new video opportunity. So let's take a show like that. Um, let's take a show that, does, that is ad supported on AMC, Walking Dead. Um, doing some gangbuster numbers, much bigger than, uh, than what we just talked about. H how do you compare the value of a show like Walking Dead, which airs on a cable network, um, to the value of a program like uh, How I Met Your Mother on CBS? Okay, well, I gotta look at my card here because I, I don't wanna misstate Walking Dead, but, so here. He knows everything. This is, where, every this is where the economics this is where you the economics of cable and the economics of broadcast television are different. So Walking Dead, one of the top shows in television. Totally. Okay. Original episodes, 16 original episodes. If you look at the original episodes, the 16 original episodes, it's, it's one of the top shows and I think it's the number one show in adults 18 to 49. All right? Currently, 303, uh, 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 currently there, ha there have been 303 airings of Walking Dead. 16 originals, 303 <coughs> airings. That is the economics of cable television. Those other airings do about one-tenth or lower than the original episode. The same thing, Duck Dynasty, even greater example, Duck Dynasty, 32 original episodes, very high rated, very successful, 1,583 repeats. Cable television is 78% repeats. Broadcast television is 25% repeats. That is the difference. It works for both. Do you think that's inherently why the ratings never get above a certain number on cable versus where they can, they typically have Well, because it's not in. economically logical for them to do that. If I, if I have a hit show like Walking Dead and I can run it and run it and run it and still get better than an, ca an average cable rating, why would I keep investing in new programming and trying to beat that? It's just, the, you know, you, you, well, they could you argue selectively they take your, get your new shows you build, and you know, they're gonna to continue to build, these mm -hmm. shows are successful, but generally cable ratings, right now we're, at cable and network television are in sort of a parody situation right now, right? One year cable's up a little, one, it's, this year broadcast is up, cable's down, last year it was uh, the reverse. Uh, the comp the broadcast top 10, is up when you account all of the other yeah. platforms, right, and okay. Top, and, and, the, and top 10 cable networks are actually losing more audience to the other cable networks than the broadcasters are now as more and more, you know, the smaller cable networks get stronger. So there's a parity situation there and we're all going to, we're each going to have hits, but a hit for cable television is going to be, it's, they've got 24 hours to fill and they're going to fill it with repeating that show because it also builds the hit. The more you repeat it, the stronger the franchise gets. Breaking Bad, because when Breaking Bad went off the air, it was hitting its high peak. Uh, and probably if there was another, if you had another episode now, it would come back stronger than it went off the air. Yeah, library is very impressive these days, right? Yep, so that is, that, and the broadcast situation is 
one repeat, and then you, you have to move on because of the economics of broadcast television. Two different models. The fact that both exist really serves the, the viewer, gives the viewer a lot of different alternatives. Uh, okay, so I've got a couple of other questions, but we don't have a lot of time. So um, what would you like to say to this crowd? You've got a mix of marketers, you've got a mix of sellers across the different, you know, the different facets of this industry. Is there anything you want to communicate to everybody? Well, one of the things I, the, about the, the session we just had, and, and I agree 100% with Walt on the idea that let's move beyond age and sex. Uh, you know, the 18 to 49 demographic is anybody who, you know, no one really believes that advertisers and marketers only look at age and sex when they choose television which, which programming. Which we don't. And, and which, uh, yeah. correct. Uh, the 18 to 49 population is declining as a percent of the total population. It is declining actually in number. There are less of them. Uh, the, uh, that, uh, it's also getting younger. Uh, the median age of 18 to 49 has gone down from 39 to about 34. As the, and what's happening the is- Millennials are moving in there? Yeah, every year, four million people turn 50 and they drop out of that demographic and four million people turn 18 and they come into that demographic. That's making the demographic younger. Uh, that, so when people talk about 18 to 49 rating decline, some of that rating decline is just a function of different people migrating in and out of, oh, the, of the demographic. So it's not a measure for the future. It, it, and there's no reason to, take, to stop looking at someone when they're 50. Moving to the types of research that I just said we're buying now, the, the type that Walt was talking about, that's the, that's the direction we have to go in. The, one, the, one problem I have with that is the way it, it's being done. And the game we play demonstrates this. You have to be careful about the statistical aspect of what you're doing. Indexing small rated cable networks is dangerous because the statistical error in the in, statistical errors get greater as you get smaller into smaller and smaller numbers. The, most of the work that I've seen of indexing low rated cable networks end up with indexes that are not statistically significant. Mm -hmm. So you have to, so is that, is that with set-top box data, you think, or with Nielsen data? That's with Nielsen data okay. in particular. So yeah. if that's you're, why we love set-top box yeah, data yeah, for, so, for that yeah, evaluation. So if you're looking at, and, 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 so if you're looking at military channel or channels like that, I would just caution you to make sure your indices are based on statistically significant differences. But okay, Matt, we got to double check that one. Mm. We found that the absolute number of, of Lingerie wearers watching the military channel. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, listen, I want to thank you for coming down here and joining us for this. And this has been really interesting for me. And um, I want to thank everybody in this audience for, for having joined us for two days. Uh, this has been, uh, I hope you feel one of the more interactive conferences I, certainly I've ever been to. Um, I hope you feel the same and that that has been a beneficial thing as opposed to a bunch of folks talking at you, um, that's the intent here is really this is supposed to be more of a community breaking down barriers and moving the industry forward than it is supposed to be a bunch of talking heads. Um, why don't we give uh, David a, a hand here for helping us out. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Josh, uh, is there anything you want to say? I just want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, David, you've been the first name we ever threw out as a speaker that we wanted to have. Was you, but thank you for coming and thank you for, thank you for participating. It's great My to have pleasure. you. My yeah. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. How about this guy? Way to go, Chris. As I let off with, Chris has been one of the most uh, um, vocal members of our community. He's really helped lead a lot of the different discussions, both at the New York Roundtable, within obviously within the summit, 
And also, as I let off with, we, um, we, built all, we build all the content off of your feedback. So please, we'd love to hear not just what we should have in discussions here, but we do a lot of working group discussions, as I said before. Um, we're working on automation with MediaOcean and basically all the top uh, media buying agencies, um, uh, as well as the major broadcast companies across uh, uh, um, broadcast and cable. Um, I would love to give uh, the, the, a hand to the team, the Videonomics team, for putting all this on. A lot of hard work going into it. The fastest way to get murdered by your own uh, teammates is to change the entire program uh, in, the, uh, in the morning at the, at the last minute, and Nicole will be uh, beating me later. So if any of you want to sneak off and kind of hide me in your bag, that would be great. Um, that's it. Thank you all for coming. Really appreciate your, your being here. We'll have uh, surveys going out. We'd love to get your feedback. And hopefully we'll see you in New York in June. Uh, that's our next event. And past that, thanks a lot for coming out. <laughs>